Welcome to Plus TV. Today we have Michael Torres from Adelante Capital, a real estate security specialist based out of California that has roughly $2.2 billion in assets under management. Can you introduce yourself and give us a background into yourself and your firm? Adelante Capital Management is a real estate securities investor. That's all we do. And we are trying to bring real estate returns to our clients by owning property stocks. The advantage of doing that is our clients have the look into the property markets, but also the, the liquidity of the li liquid markets. We use a net asset value approach. So we really look at it as if we're buying buildings today for our clients. And I think that's one of the most attractive uh, parts of this. There's great assets that trade on the New York Stock Exchange today. So, you know, my background, not only as a money manager, but in the early 90s, I developed the Wilshire Real Estate Securities Index. Prior to that, I had been a mortgage lender on large commercial real estate portfolios and had interest, family interest in property and apartments and hotels. Michael, the index you developed, the Wilshire U.S. Real Estate Investment Trust Index, was at its peak in 2007, but hammered by the subprime crisis, fell from peak to trough in 2008. Can you talk about what you saw as a professional real estate investor during this time period? You have to look at phases of the REIT market. Again, 2004, when Fed Chairman Greenspan basically moved to lower rates, their access to capital securitization engine really started to ramp up not only for residential real estate but for property securities we saw the market peak in 2007 when eop was taken private by blackstone actually the market sold off about 17 percent over the next 12 months the REIT market really struggled in the fourth quarter of 2008 because of loss of confidence in the financial system not you know as banks started to lose confidence in each other the thin slicing of mortgage securities basically separated the relationship between owner and lender, which caused a lot of strain because the liquidity in the public market, people would just leave and say, I'll come back and look at this. So it was a pretty dreadful time. The market was signaling valuation concerns, but also relationships of capital. So the response and where we really bottomed was a result of how do we delever the industry? And that really started in late March of 2009. We've raised a lot of capital. The companies have done a very good job of starting to delever, term out a lot of their loans, and reduce their cost of capital. So the bond market has really loved the REITs at this point. When you look at the dramatic decline, peak to trough, REITs fell 62% over about a 15-month period, but it was really exacerbated in the fourth quarter of 2008. So Holding a business together when you're basically top line revenue drops 62% and relationships, it's really trying to explain to the clients what we do is we're buying property. So we're looking through the securities prices. The assets are still the same and we had confidence in the assets. What you're able to do by investing in public securities is you have the transparency of the properties, but also you have the transparency of the balance sheets and you, you can make decisions. So really the market responded first because of the crisis. It's easy to say, I'm gonna reduce my exposure, which was the sell-off, okay? The snap back basically is a sense of confidence is being restored in the companies as well as the visibility into the cash flows. I mean, one of the things right now that's helping the industry immensely and helping the banking system is the transparency that we have into a very large portfolio of owned assets comparables. You focus on public real estate. Talk to us about the relationship between public and private real estate. What we saw is investors in private real estate don't have the transparency with their general partners. They don't know how they're leveraged and neither do their financial partners. So there was a stickiness in the private market, a lot of anxiety. We actually helped guide our clients through expectations of price decline that they should experience in private portfolios over the coming year, which kind of panned out. For example, I have one client that had 50% REITs and 50% in a private open-end fund. And the client said, okay, we're over allocated to real estate because of the stock market decline. And we said, well, I don't think you're over allocated. You just haven't taken the write downs in your private real estate. And they were prepared to sell the REITs. We convinced them to hold the REITs, hold their private, 
And what you saw is a snapback in the REITs. They would have sold the REITs at the bottom. So it's a natural reaction. You have to understand the lead and lag between public market real estate and private markets. Since bottoming out in 2008, the U.S. real estate market has recovered nicely and nearly reached its previous highs. What is your future outlook? Is there any room left for growth in the U.S. real estate market? You know, I think that w one of the things that we've seen when you look at the, the, the recovery in share prices and the demand for income today is that the investors need to understand there's a bifurcation in quality. Okay? Not all real estate is the same. We, obviously, it's pretty clear to people the difference between residential and commercial today. Now it's the distinction between investment grade commercial, and kind of everything else that's commodity. And I think when pe people get confused when they see all of the vacancy signs or for rent signs, they say real estate can't be good. The reality in the public market is already priced in. Okay, and so vacancy actually sometimes creates opportunity because the companies, if they fill it, that's cash flow. So more cash flow, more value. Real estate securities is probably one of the leading assets today at the midway mark in most investors' portfolio that have incorporated them. And so we're now seeing that we're within 5% of the 2007 highs. And on one hand, people would say the environment's actually worse because there's not job growth and the economy is not growing as robustly as it was in 2007. Where candidly, I look at it, it's quite positive because we do have ec some economic growth Okay, we have no new construction, which is great for owners. And we have continued obsolescence of physical plants. So those companies, which we own, basically, they can continue to invest and be competitive, capture all the marginal demand. So I think the environment's pretty good today. I think the concern is we have to break through that 07 high. And as we do that, what is the response? Now, if capital gets sloppy and we start having a construction boom, it could easily look like the world, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s. That wouldn't be good. When you look at the fundamentals and what's happening in different property types, we're actually seeing rents that are higher than 2007. So I actually feel pretty optimistic because we have very little construction. We have a private industry that's still struggling to gain access to capital. And with modest economic growth, buildings depreciate every day. So that's good for owners that are well capitalized and compete for the marginal demand. You also invest globally. Talk to us about global opportunities in real estate. We do invest globally in the developed markets. Uh, we're having a very good year around the globe. Part of that is low interest rates and also capital seeking yield today. While the REITs are up about 17.5% here in North America, what you see is in Europe, which has certainly caught a lot of attention, the returns have been pretty good as well. Germany up 22%, the UK up over 20%, so about 13% for the region, not so bad. Obviously, uh, the southern part of the region is struggling. Spain down 67%, which is pretty strong. To the downside, Asia has done extremely well. Again, regionally, when you look, Singapore is up about 35%. Japan, 22.5% post-tsunami, and then Australia up 19.5%. So the, the region's done reasonably well. Again, one of the things that's very attractive investing globally, you're looking at a lot of these developed markets where there are quality assets in institutional location where you have lease duration. So again, it's moving up in the kind of capital stack of the economy. With the current uncertainty around sovereign bonds, a lot of investors have rekindled interest in asset classes like hard assets and real estate. What are your observations here? Again, I think when you look at the property markets, how do you access it? Okay, while there's demand and they want inflation protection in the assets, it's really how do you get easily deploy capital to quality assets? Public securities, pretty easy way to do it. Good transparency, institutional locations. And I think the most important thing I keep harping on is really lease duration. And that's really helpful today to be able to analyze the safety of the dividends. We're now starting to see the, those equity securities where people pursue dividend yield, maybe not so safe. You know, super value cutting, you know, rescinding its dividend 
is a good example of that. Here with the property companies, the occupancies are, are good. Same store rental growth has been good. Okay. And so the dividends are pretty well protected. Property continues to provide a defensive role in people's portfolio. We're not, I don't think we have seen the demand where there's the value creation through development. I think the companies that are well capitalized will take advantage of dislocation. My expectation is in Europe that it probably over the next five years, we will see the listing of new portfolios as a way to re-equitize the banks, not too dissimilar to the savings and loan crisis we saw here in the late 80s. So my expectation is you get a chance to price, reprice assets in Europe. So talk more about what investor is looking for when he invests with you. Investors are interested today in being able to access the commercial real estate in an efficient way, but also they're realizing the benefits of listed securities because of the transparency, the liquidity, the ability to rebalance and change their mind. I think in a world that continues to be uncertain, rebalancing is critical. And I think we provide that and you can use, hold real estate over a long period of time. But the beauty of the real estate securities market is you can add and you can subtract to your allocation. So it's managing that exposure that's really important for our clients. And we work with them to talk about valuations, prospects for the companies, the health of their balance sheets, which, you know, one of the opportunities today is the companies in this low yield environment continue to lower their cost of capital. So not only have they termed out their liabilities, but they're reducing their costs. So I think it's putting in place years of probably some pretty good earnings growth. Commonly, people think of real estate as an asset that you buy and put away. And the reality of being passive owners of property in an actively managed portfolio is challenging. And I think that we've seen our, we've helped our institutional clients actually add REITs to their private holdings for price discovery, for better discussions with their private managers, because we see the lead and the lag between public and private pricing. And I think that's really important and why a number of clients have added us to their portfolio to complete their allocation. Again, private pools of capital are formed. They don't always transact. And so this way, it gives the client exposure to the property market when they want it.